Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Molina. I'm a vascular surgeon, and we're going to discuss my personal journey to understanding lymphedema and phlebolymphedema. An honorarium has been provided by Tactile. I'm a member of the Speakers Bureau for Tactile, and Google Images and Tactile Images have been utilized for this presentation. In medical school, we were all taught the classic Starling principle that Ernst Starling developed in 1896. This microvascular fluid exchange model discusses hydrostatic pressures which push fluid through the artery and the capillaries into the interstitium, where the vast majority is then reabsorbed by the veins. We can see in this image that Dr. Starling demonstrates again that net fluid movement is out of the uh, arteries and subsequently is reabsorbed in the post-capillary venules. As a, vascular, as a practicing vascular surgeon, I typically evaluated varicose veins in an isolated fashion, looking at the classic CEAP, standing for clinical etiology, anatomic, and pathophysiology clinical classifications. In the clinical classification, class one stands for telangiectasias, class two is the type ordinary varicose veins, type three is the presence of edema, type four is development of hyperpigmentation and skin changes such as eczema. Class five is a healed venous ulcer and class six is the presence of a venous ulcer. In my early practice as a vascular surgeon, I had an underappreciation of the degree of lymphedema impact on the patients that I served, especially with advanced venous disease. And it wasn't typically until patients presented in these very advanced phases of lymphedema that I would begin to recognize the presence of significant interstitial edema and advanced lymphedema stages. As I evaluated more data, I became aware of the importance of recognizing lymphedema in association with venous disease, now known as phlebolymphedema. Phlebolymphedema begins in the C3 status and has now been definitively demonstrated by near-infrared imaging to exist with lymphatic dysfunction in late stages of C3, C4, C5, and C6. This is representing a new dawn in the era of lymphedema management. And it's important to recognize that lymphedema is closely linked with advanced vascular vascular venous disease. But the average medical student still only receives 30 minutes of education on lymphatics and venous dysfunction. The glycocalyx is a gel-like impermeable layer that lines all blood vessels down to the five micron level. There's approximately 60 to 100,000 miles of arteries, veins, and lymphatics in our body. The importance of the recognition of the glycocalyx is that it alters the classic Starling understanding and prevents reabsorption of interstitial fluid into the veins. The role of the healthy glycocalyx is fourfold. It improves endothelial function. As the little hairs of the glycocalyx move, it results in a shear force that can release nitric oxide. It decreases permeability and therefore does not allow fluid reabsorption into the veins as the classic Starling model described. It is very important in the terms of coagulation and inhibits platelet adherence and has an important impact on coagulation regulatory factors. The importance of preventing inflammation by preventing leukocyte adhesion, which subsequently can increase uh, the risk of chronic venous disease. In the revised Starling principle, we note that the glycocalyx prevents reabsorption of lymphatic fluid into the vein, and now we recognize that 100% of all lymphatic fluid must enter the lymphatics to be returned to the venous system. The clinical implications, uh, as described by Michael and Mortimer and Roxon, describe that all chronic lymphedema indicates an inadequacy of failure of lymphatic drainage. This now has a significant implication for how we treat lymph lymphatic and venous disease in that we have to treat both the lymphatic as well as the venous disease to achieve maximal patient outcomes. Near-infrared imaging, a science advanced by Dr. Eva Sevic uh, Maraca, has demonstrated that lymphatic dysfunction exists 
within advanced venous disease by the introduction of indocyanin green into the subdermal lymphatic collection system. We can note in uh, the initial panel that there is normal function. However, in a patient that has congenital lymphatic disorder, there's significant dermal backflow. When this was performed in patients that had C6 disease with open venous ulcers, it demonstrated significant dermal backflow and with the use of an advanced pneumatic compression device, there was significant clearing of the subdermal lymphatic collections. This is also noted in the patient that has C4 disease in the lower panels. Phlebolymphedema disease progression is again now recognized both in near-infrared imaging, which we can correlate with clinical and physical findings and have a significant impact on how we now should treat patients with a recognition. This slide demonstrates the progressive spiral of lymphatic dysfunction. With advanced phlebolymphedema, the lymphatic system is overloaded, resulting in compromised immune response. This increases the risk of skin infection on cellulitis. With the development of cellulitis, lymphatic function is further compromised and can be even uh, further damaged. This can result in skin fibrosis and subsequent progressive lymphatic damage, and the vicious cycle continues. The cost of cellulitis and skin infections was recently published in JAMA Dermatology in 2019. This was a retrospective cohort analysis of U.S. national readmission rates and um, utilized 2014 nationwide readmission database. In this cohort, 9.8% of almost 450,000 cellulitic admissions were associated with non-elective readmissions within 30 days. This resulted in a total cost of more than $500 million for all-cause non-elective readmissions, and the readmissions for skin and subcutaneous infections cost more than $100 million. Obviously, this is a significant economic burden. The economic burden directly related to venous leg ulcers was published by uh, Dr. O'Donnell et al. in Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2014. And this demonstrates in a real contemporary vascular practice a total cost of approximately $10,500 over the course of 120 days of uh, cost. The total cost was threefold higher if the ulcer failed to resolve. Nearly two-thirds of the admissions were for treatment of cellulitis with intravenous antibiotics that were and resistant to the typical cares of outpatient treatments. Again, the overall burden from an economic value as well as from a societal value for treatment of venous leg ulcers is significant. Most of this is related to the undiagnosed aspect of the uh, associated phlebolymphedema. Another study that demonstrates the economic burden of cellulitis infections in venous leg ulcers demonstrated healthcare system spending for a single episode of cellulitis, including four days of hospitalization, was approximately $16,000. If we evaluate total cost per year for a venous leg ulcer, it's approximately $15,700 and can more than double to $30,000 to $35,000 for those venous leg ulcers that fail to heal. Dr. Wade Farrow, who developed the Farrow Wrap, wrote an excellent study in 2010 regarding the underdiagnosis and undertreatment of phlebolymphedema within the wound clinic environment. He stated that simple compression concentrates proteins, creating a pro-inflammatory environment. The proteins and the pro-inflammatory cytokines can subsequently lead to tissue fibrosis. This can then result in breakdown of uh, skin integrity resulting in bacteria rapidly propagating into the subdermal protein rich lymphatic fluid. This subsequently res can result again in that cycle of cellulitis, de decreased function in the lymphatics, and subsequent progressive fibrosis and damage of lymphatics. Successful treatment of phlebolymphedema requires appropriate drainage of the protein rich lymph fluid that is within the subdermal collection. And again, we've demonstrated based on near-fly data and based upon our understanding now of phlebolymphedema that this, this requires treatment of the lymphatic system and not simply treatment of the venous insufficiency. In the 2015 Journal of American Medical Association Dermatology study that evaluated uh, cancer and non-cancer patient treatments of lymphedema, 
with utilization of an advanced pneumatic compression device, uh, FlexiTouch had a significant impact on a reduction in rates of cellulitis by almost 80%, a 54% reduction in the rate of inpatient hospitalizations, a 40% reduction in the rate of outpatient hospital visits, and this was uh, summated in an overall reduction of total cost of 37%. A New York uh, study performed in 2015 also demonstrated that utilization of FlexiTouch had a significant reduction of cellulitic episodes and a significant reduction in overall number of venous leg ulcers. In the 2018 Journal of Vascular Surgery study, FlexiTouch was compared to other advanced pneumatic compression devices in the scope of conservative therapy. It's important to note that when we discuss FlexiTouch therapy, it is not a standalone therapy and should be utilized in the setting of cares through a lymphedema clinic with a physical therapist or a occupational therapist. When we compare FlexiTouch with conservative therapy to conservative therapy alone, there is a significant cost reduction of approximately 69% when conservative therapy and simple pneumatic devices are compared to conservative therapy plus FlexiTouch, there is an 85% cost reduction. And when we compare it other advanced pneumatic compression devices used in the scope of conservative therapy compared to conservative therapy with FlexiTouch, we see, a, again, a significant reduction overall cost of 53%. This slide demonstrates that venous and lymphatic disease is, is again, intimately associated in terms of dysfunction as the venous disease becomes more progressive. Physicians recognize C2 disease as typically type ordinary varicose veins. In C3, we recognize the onset of edema. In C4, we recognize skin changes and subsequent fibrosis. In C5, we recognize a healed ulceration, and C6 is a current active venous leg ulceration. The importance of recognizing flebal lymphedema existence within the C3 to C6 patients allows improved patient outcomes when appropriate treatment, uh, appropriate treatment of lymphedema is performed. In conclusion, venous and lymphatic anatomy and disease states are undertaught as part of the U.S. medical system, each medical student now receiving less than 30 minutes of education in years one and two. The recognition of the glycocalyx has resulted in a revision of the 1896 Starling Principle, and we now understand that 100% of lymphatic interstitial fluid must return through the lymphatic system, and no fluid is returned through the venous circulation. This also implies that all chronic edema is a result of inadequate lymphatic drainage. The development and advancement of near-infrared imaging has helped us to understand and correlate chronic lymphatic dysfunction with advanced venous disease. Lymphatic dysfunction and flebal lymphedema are associated with an increased risk of cellulitis, chronic inflammation, and progressive lymphatic damage, and we know this to be a vicious circle that until we treat the underlying lymphatic dysfunction is difficult to arrest. Venous leg ulcers and cellulitis are associated with an increased rate of hospitalization, outpatient care, and medical resource utilization. FlexiTouch Plus, when used as part of dual therapy through a certified lymphedema clinic that utilizes manual lymphatic drainage and complete decongestive therapy has been now clinically proven in multiple studies to be economically advantageous by decreasing cellulitis, hospitalizations, and outpatient visits. Thank you. Dr. Moline, on behalf of Tactile Medical, thank you so much for your presentation and Congratulations on your multiple talks at the American Vein and Lymphatic Society Annual Congress last weekend. Uh, really appreciate all of your knowledge and sharing with us today. For those of you who took the time out of your busy schedules to join this webinar, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, and as we're waiting for calls to come in through the phone system, we're going to turn to some of the questions that came in through the Q&A widget online. If you do think of questions after today's webinar, please get those to your tactile medical uh, product specialist as we will get those to Dr. Moline and follow up via email after the fact. So one of the questions that came in through the Q&A widget during the lecture 
Uh, the question says, does the study you presented on the slide uh, comparing the cost of uh, treatments include the cost of the pump and is, the, is that the cost savings presented? Uh, Dan, thank you for the question. Again, uh, I'm, I want to thank everybody that took time out of their busy clinic day to spend time with us. Uh, one of our big uh, promotions is trying to do venous education, lymphatic education, and then the combined flebo lymph education. And being down at uh, ABLS this last weekend, it was really humbling. A lot of fabulous people, uh, Karen Irv, Steve Dean, they really opened up some significant doors for some of us to come down there and present, and it was uh, a really great opportunity. In regards to that particular study, that was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2018, and it's a health economic study where they data mined. And one of the unique things about tactile is because they do all the servicing, all the billing, all the charging, they can associate every order with an NPI number. So they know exactly uh, the billing process and working with the pairs to get um, to get the pumps to, uh, or the lymphedema pumps to patients. So really to equalize everything because the other companies don't have access to that data, the cost of the pumps was pulled out of that study and that way it's more of an altruistic view so you can see what the results are of the different pumps on simply the medical care. Um, there's other data that's been published in papers that have shown that if you Put the, the once you've covered the cost to, to cover the cost of the pump can take somewhere around 0.7 of a year and even there's data that shows uh, six tenths of a year six tenths of 12 months will actually cover the cost of the pump and and I think it's really important to remember unlike an oil change in your car this is a one-time cost once it's once it's purchase, this pump is going to be uh, useful on a daily basis for multiple years. So I think if we're going to amortize it, kind of like a house mortgage, you're, it accelerates uh, how quickly the house is paid off for because of the benefits in, the, in, uh, in terms of downhill cost for lymphedema cares markedly decrease. So I, I, that's a really insightful question, uh, the person that asked that, and I, I hope that uh, clears it up a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Milan. I think that's a fantastic answer and um, really a, a good way to think about this is a, a very much an investment in managing and preventing those costs um, annually. So uh, thank you for that. Next, we're going to turn to a question that came from VCU Medical Center, Dr. Michael Amendola. Uh, first says, thank you for presenting. Uh, and it's actually a two-part question. Um, so one is, do you know of any medical therapies that affect the lymphatic return? And then two, what imaging studies are you currently using for lymphedema diagnosis, or is it a strict clinical diagnosis? Michael, excellent question. I'll, let me start with the imaging studies first. Um, the classical imaging studies, of course, that we don't do anymore would be lymphangiography. Uh, we try to avoid putting... Uh, dies into the lymphatic system. Usually, uh, they're already damaged. When I or they, they'll further, it won't change your outcomes at this point unless you're thinking about doing lymphatic reconstruction. When I was down at ABLS this last week and I saw Dr. Peter Nilligen speak, and just a gifted plastic surgeon out of the state of Washington, he showed these fascinating pictures of MRIs of the lymphatic system, which reconstruction of 3D, and he's using this uh, more so to be able to do planning for reconstructive surgery and also just purely diagnostic. Um, sometimes he'll run into uh, big um, uh, lymphatic malformations that will change how he does a surgical procedure. And then he's doing intraoperative uh, injection of um, fluoroscopy to be able to more, further image as he's doing his reconstructive methods. The, the classic one we all think about is lymphocentigraphy. I, I have decreased my overall ordering of lymphocentigraphy only because as I've treated more and more patients with flebo lymphedema, the, the diagnosis has just become so apparent, especially based on the studies that uh, Eva and Aldridge and Rasmussen have done down in Houston that have shown that when you do microdosing of indocyanin green, if you have stasis dermatitis changes in the skin, you know by default automatically there are, there's, there's lymphatic dysfunction and lymphedema as well. So every patient I see now that is a late stage C3, a C4, a C5, C6, we, we just know every one of those patients has associated lymphedema. So I, I've stopped studying those folks from a lymphatic standpoint. I still, of course, get all those folks uh, ax, superficial and deep venous reflux and look for, is, was there an asymptomatic DVT before? 
Um, in terms of medical treatment, there's really good evidence for if you're looking at straight venous leg ulcers, there's been people, I used to use a lot of Trental, pentoxifiline, uh, it would be dosed one tablet three times a day. I've read a lot of the medical treatment using Daflons or the Diazmin Hesperidins. Um, the United States version of that is called Vascularia. Um, in Europe, there's been 40 plus studies that have now been done. Ten, I believe, of those were RCTs. Very good, robust data that's come out of Europe in terms of benefit for flavonoids, and specifically the Daflons or what are called micro. Uh, pure, pure ni or micro purified flavonoid fractions. And the reason it's called that is that to get it small enough to get good bioabsorbability uh, is one of the important things. Um, the unique thing about vascular is they add an alkalinizing agent just because of the citrus component because these are all coming from the rinds of uh, oranges. So I do think there's really good robust data that supports using a flavonoid. And um, it takes about three months to, to really have an impact. So I think we also have to just uh, let patients know it's going to take a little bit to have an impact. But I do, I am using this uh, quite liberally on all my patients now. All right, great uh, way of covering the, the two-parter there. Um, and Dr. Molina, as you were, were providing that answer, uh, a thank you came in from Dr. Amadola as well. So thank you. Um, let's turn next, a question from University of New Mexico from uh, Dr. Mark Langfeld. How much does obesity contribute to leg edema with or without venous disease? So I think we've all, Mark, it's a great question. It's, it can get really complex. Um, clearly, obesity, because of the uh, impact upon the abdominal domain, can have a huge impact on the retro, retroperitoneal space and increase lymphatic uh, dysfunction. So I think we've all now become accustomed with the phrase uh, obesity-related re uh, lymphedema disease. And then, of course, I think the people that we have to really tease out of that group are the ones that don't that are not obese because of a caloric issue, but the ones that have lipidema that then is complicated or weaponized by our caloric, unrestricted state in the United States. So I think it's also really important to diagnose the patients with lipedema. Steve Dean and Karen Erbs have taught me so much about this. And if you don't know much about lipedema, I, I would uh, tell you there's a great open access article from 2016 uh, that Karen Erbs and Don Buck wrote, and I hand that out to all my patients. We have to tease out the lipedema patients because if we try to calorie restrict them and try to get them to exercise, they might lose uh, fat on the torso and up, but they're not going to be able to lose it from the buttocks on down. It gets super frustrating for them, and it's it, it, it ends up fat shaming them. So um, if it's pure caloric excess, um, I, I'm getting those folks involved, obviously, with a, a bariatrician and nutrition services, getting them into an exercise program. And oftentimes that will help us significantly in terms of uh, management of the lymphatic dysfunction. Once we get into a point where they've got open ulcerations and weeping and lymphorrhea in excess, then it, almost all those patients have primary lymphedema component that even after shedding the weight, they're still going to be dealing with a long-term issue. And I think we have to be um, more aggressive with those uh, folks if they've gotten to that point. It's, it's a really excellent question. Thank you for asking that, Mark. All right, Dr. Millian, thank you very much for the answer. And I, again, completely echo, I, um, having heard Dr. Herbst and Dean speak often about that, interestingly, always referring to uh, obesity very much as kind of a chicken and the egg effect of both a cause and an effect of lymphedema. So uh, great answer on that one. Um, I want to turn next to a question that came in through the Q&A widget. Uh, as you're thinking about risk factors, what do you look at in a swollen leg that increases a patient's chance for a VLU? So if a patient, um, if we're worried about VLU and swelling, we, we got to kind of go back and just go back to history. So has the patient had a superficial thrombophobitis? Has there been a, a DVT? Has there been a pulmonary embolus? Does the patient have a cable filter? Has it been removed? Has the patient had iliac stents before, significant abdominal trauma, vein harvest for a heart bypass? Any prior malignancies, any current malignancies, which of course increases their uh, hypercoagulability status? Has there been groin surgery in the past? Has there been a lymph node resection? Um, obesity, as we just talked about, diabetes and tobacco can certainly play into making these conditions worse. 
uh, liver disease, renal disease, people certainly on dialysis, uh, and cardiac disease, CHF, can certainly make all of this worse. I think the other really important thing that Tom O'Donnell brought out, uh, I think a med student co-wrote this with him at Tufts, and it just came out in Journal of Vascular Surgery about a year ago, is that we can't forget about what's going on between the ears. In, in our patient populations that, that's depressed, and certainly the patients coming into our wound clinic, we have a high percentage of patients that are depressed. It's hard for them to simply just brush their teeth, much less take care of these really complex wounds. And so when it, we're trying to guide them on how to take care of their wounds, and if you're saying, look, I want you to pull on your compression socks, do this, you know, ABZ, A, B, C, D, E, F, G on your wound, and I want you to do a flea balloon, and I want you to do a, a pump on your legs, and I want you to take this medication, I want you to exercise, and I want you to eat less, it's completely overwhelming. So I think we have to be really sensitive and pick up on this issue. If somebody's got depression, we're not going to get good adherence rates until we help guide them through that. And I do think if you work in a wound clinic, it's important to pick up on this and get the primary care doc involved and um, and get this patient some help because that's going to improve your outcomes in uh, in the wound clinic. It's, a, it's an excellent question. I'm glad somebody asked that. And I think it's a really important part of your answer, Dr. Moline, uh, what you mentioned about the psychosocial elements of it and, and really getting those patients um, treatment for that part and making sure that they're empowered to take care of themselves in a chronic condition like this. So thank you for a fantastic answer. Um, turning next, um, a really good question came in because uh, you've spoken so often about the importance of incorporating the lymphedema therapist into your practice as a vascular specialist. So the question says, what advice would you offer to vascular specialists for working more closely with a certified lymphedema therapist? So I would, honestly, I tell you, don't do what I've done most of my career, where I simply was getting a piece of paper from a therapist. I was signing it, and I was saying, just get it taken care of without really totally comprehending what was going on. Um, I have really worked hard to 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 team build and and all of us want this because we all want good outcomes for our patients. So I would tell you put a face to the signature, go visit the the lymphedema therapist, see what they do. Um, understand their philosophies, understand their trainings, understand what LANA is, understanding what the, um, all the associations they do and the professionalism they have. Usually they've been doing this for a long time. They're, they're very, uh, they're, they're, they're like health coaches. So they will augment your outcomes if you understand what they do and building this relationship, I think, goes a long ways towards it. So they care just as much about getting patients healed and keeping them healed as we do, and they are facilitators. So ultimately, in building this relationship, um, and I don't order a uh, lymphedema pump without ordering a therapist. So I call it, it's called dual therapy because a pump with a patient without a therapist is not going to have good outcomes. So I purposely will order the therapist first, so I don't forget to order the therapist, and then I'll take the measurements and order the uh, pump, all the uh, the initial consult if it's appropriate. And the the lymphedema therapist will really offload your practice. I, I think in our busy practices, we don't have the time to sit here and be the excellent health coaches that we really would like to be in our heart and souls. And so building this bonding relationship and really empowering and and enabling the, uh, the the lymphedema therapist will maximize your outcomes. People will notice, family practice will notice, internal medicine will notice your it will boost your um, it'll boost your clinic in many ways and it'll set you apart. So I would tell you don't make the mistake I did. Do it sooner and don't wait till you're halfway through your career. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Moline. Um, again, I think that speaks back to, uh, in having referenced AVLS earlier, I think uh, more physicians thinking like you do and incorporating the lymphedema therapist into the venous practice is really, really important for getting the best care for these patients with mixed venous and lymphatic disease. So thank you. Uh, a question came in on the Q&A widget again, uh, stating, what characteristics and history do you look for in distinguishing if lymphedema is primary or secondary, and then how do you code for that? Yeah, another another really good uh, functional question because this really then comes down to what are we doing at the time that we see the patient because if we're going to get our patient covered to see the lymphedema therapist to get their garments to get a to get a lymphedema pump, we have to have the right 
documentation, we have to have the right coding, and that all then goes back to taking a really good history and making sure that it gets into the document. So um, the first thing I would tell you is it, there's a template that exists within Tactile. They've been very altruistic on this. It is not brand specific. If you don't have this template, we're Epic based and it's in our system. Um, I know it can go into almost any system. I would incorporate that in because that's your checklist that helps remind you what you need to pick up on a physical examination and document to help your patient get the treatments they need. So. Uh, I also referenced before a paper by Drs. Mortimer and Roxon that was 2014 about the changes in how we understand uh, lymphedema. And it's figure three or four that talks about phenotypic and genotypical types of things to differentiate primary from secondary. One of the things we know now is that there are many, many more patients that have primary lymphedema that may show up right at birth called congenital. It may show up uh, like after, after for a woman after uh, onset of menses until about age 30. For a man before age 30, that's called lymphedema uh, precox. And then after age 30 or 40, it's called uh, lymphedema tarda. All those are primary lymphedemas. Clearly, we're seeing more and more patients show up in their 50s, 60s, 70s, where there's almost like a tipping event. And the analogy I use is the patient that had a knee replacement, never had an infection, never had an issue with the knee, orthopedic surgeon did a fabulous job, no DVTs, no deep venous insufficiency, nothing, and yet their leg's still swollen four years later. Um, and these patients, more likely than not, are primary lymphedema tarda. So when it comes to the documentation piece, as, you're, as you do your accurate documentation to, to note uh, the lymphedema existence, and then when it comes time to code it, it's coded as I as Q82.0, so Q82.0, and I always then write after that diagnosis, primary lymphedema tarda, to indicate that that's that. And we have uh, multiple papers now in peer-reviewed uh, literature that would support that viewpoint. There's a lymphocentigraphy study that just came out last year. There is Dr. Mortimer and Roxon's paper that came out. There's a genetic paper that uh, Dr. Michael Feldman had uh, wrote out of Chicago. So there's 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 multiple papers I think we can utilize to justify that diagnosis. That's the diagnosis that helps our patients ultimately get um, the treatments from a from the therapist for their compression wraps, for their physical therapy, occupational therapy, and for a flebal lymphedema pump. So good, good question. I'm glad somebody asked that. All right, thank you, Dr. Malin. Very comprehensive answer, uh, looking at both the physical findings and family history and, and getting to that correct diagnosis. So thank you very much for that. At this time, we do not have any additional questions coming in over the phone or through the Q&A widget, so we'd like to conclude today's webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Malin, for sharing your expertise, and thank you to all of you across the country that joined us for this webinar. Again, if you do have questions that come up after the fact, please get those to your tactile medical product specialist so that we can follow up on email. Thank you again and have a fantastic day.